Our panel is the Secret Santa Enterprise Adoption, and uh, I think that was the uh, sex appeal title to get everyone in here. With uh, <laughs> We're going to be openly sharing a lot of information, so it's more accurately the insights to a successful enterprise adoption. And I'll be your moderator today. We've got 40 minutes of which we'll save the last 15 minutes for, for questions, so feel free to ask the panel uh, towards the end. But with us today, we have Dawn Bridges from Jacobs. She is an engineering technology strategist. Next to her is James Alari, uh, engineering technology and strategy team lead at PowerStream. Uh, Zach Penix, who is the emerging technologies manager at AES. And on the end is Chris Croto, director of business development for the new devices group, Headworn Computing at Intel. Uh, if you could take a minute and introduce uh, both what your company does from how you're looking at, at wearables uh, or your experience with it and a little bit of your role in that company's journey. Start? Yeah, let's start, start over here. Um, so we have uh, grassroots um, wearables going on in the company um, and we have a lot of standards. We've been working through a lot of standards uh, for everything, whether it's global, you know, standards for the company or back-end standards and that sort of thing. But we don't have an organized um, standard for bringing the wearables to the broader audience. So at this point, we've been looking at all of the things we've done to date, all of the standards we've put in place, whether they're work, uh, work process standards, uh, that kind of thing, and looking at what the pros and cons of what we've done in the past have been, as well as some of the new technologies that are being brought up by <clears throat> some of our younger folks um, realizing that there's a need to have some new technology in their work, work environment. Yeah. James, what sorts of problems are you looking at through a um, connected workforce? Uh, with the connected workforce, some of the issues that we're finding is some of the back-end data is not where it needs to be um, in order for them to consume it from a mobile standpoint. So uh, when we were looking in the HoloLens uh, in particular, we wanted to do some augmented reality there. We're looking into a company called AugView uh, to do some augmented reality there where they go, guys go out into the field. Um, we're an electrical distribution company, so we have guys doing the poles and wires and, and doing all that sort of stuff. Um, and they want to be able to go out there and see their design and see their poles and see their wires um, kind of in real time with augmented reality. Um, but what we found was our geographical information system wasn't truly geolocated. So they couldn't go out there and really um, see what they wanted to see, where it's supposed to be. Um, so that's some of the issues that we're finding um, right now with, with regards to wearables and with regards to uh, moving towards that mobile um, environment. Mm -hmm. Zach, AES is a Fortune 200 utility company. And from the discussions we've had, you're looking at wearables across a variety of things and not necessarily the, the traditional sense of, that we think about it currently in, in Gartner's hype cycle. Um, what do you see and where, where are you looking uh, for wearables across AES? Sure, yeah, so as you were mentioning, AES is a multinational power and utility company. We operate in 17 countries and we operate everything from generation assets like power plants and solar farms to distribution companies as well. So we work with a lot of power lines all the way to the end customers. And so for us, you know, wearables has been a multi-decade initiative. <laughs> Uh, people don't think about it, but the most prolific wearable in your company is the badge that you all wear. Uh, it's old school wearable, as I like to call it. Um, there's a lot of neat advancements with that technology, second generation RFID, where you can do uh, like far field tracking of people on a floor. So for AES specifically, to your question, you know, AES, as we are a multinational power and utility, our real focus is improving safety. And we think that everything else comes after that. So for us, what we look for is how do I keep our people safe? And then secondarily, how do we make them more efficient? And so for us, any and all wearables that we can look at or engage with that's going to improve our people's safety, we find very beneficial. So keeping people identified where they are on a site, make sure that they're in the right location at the right time, the entire lockout, tagout process to make sure someone's not working on a power line and someone else turns on the electricity to that power line, that's extremely important. Um, you know, the, what the product we work with, electricity, kills people. Um, but at the same time, keeping it up uh, is the reason why we're not having this conversation in the dark. Uh, and so, you know, like I said, we want to identify where people are. We want to alert them when they're around hazardous environments whether there's high voltage electricity or there might be construction going on in that environment. 
Um, we, you know, there's a lot of wearables that we've been using as well in the entire energy industry. Um, I think you gave me the term electronic canary. Uh, the concept of, you know, alerting people to hazardous gases, that's another important one. Um, and then, you know, we, we take a very uh, conservative approach um, to evaluating things like augmented reality, uh, wearables, um, to, you know, that entire gamut of, of categories here. But, you know, fundamentally, keep people safe, give them the information that they need to stay out of harm's way. That's, that's our real focus. And Chris, Intel is a household name and what's powered you know, our entire lifetime of compute. How is that changing now with Intel being one of the most prolific names in augmented reality and, and wearables for the next generation of compute? Well, first off, I'm really glad my products don't kill people. So <laughs> uh, I don't know how you manage that every day, but good for you, Zach. Um, we, uh, we, we've seen this trend and, and our group's been around for about three years uh, from a wearable technology perspective. Uh, both in head-mounted displays and augmented reality, head-mounted technologies, audio technologies. So it's not just about uh, AR. It's really about everything that we're doing in and above the neck. And, and uh, we're one of the few companies that I've seen that separated the Internet of Things from machines and industrial and people. And I really liked what Tom was talking about this morning around human factors. We're very, very focused on design and on the human factor engineering and not just how big a battery and how much technology can we jam on somebody's head or wrist or waist or shirt or shoe or wherever we're putting it, but literally how do people use the technology? How will they put it on themselves? And, and what we found in working through this is the nature of the fact that when you put it on your person, whether you're at work or in your personal life, it is an embodiment of who you are and how you're represented to the world. So it's very different than building a server processor that we're gonna put in a rack or a mobile phone uh, device and a modem that you're gonna stick in your pocket. When you make it part of yourself, it says something about you and your identity to the world and that adds a whole another dimension of complexity in designing products that people will use. Great. So I have a couple questions that I'll ask. Um, I'll, I'll pick someone to kind of lead the answer and then feel free to, to jump in if it, if it uh, strokes a concept for you. But what we have seen, and I think over the last uh, couple of months, 2016, we've seen more and more companies talking about how they've actually succeeded with wearables. Their journeys have all been very different. Um, you know, no, no one company on stage is alike. Um, but lessons learned from deploying previous generations of technology, particularly other uh, mobility devices, have uh, frequently helped pave the way for wearables. Uh, James, when we were talking on the prep call, you had some insights that, that you thought would be um, good to share from your experience getting uh, PowerStream modernized with a, with a mobility workforce. Yeah, I think to, to step back, what, what we had to do with PowerStream and to get people into mobility and really any technology in general is, um, and I know a lot of people will probably agree here, when it comes to IT and business units, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum a lot of times. The business units don't know what IT is doing and IT doesn't know what the business units are doing. And sometimes IT is even behind like a, a locked door where no one has access into. So, Which uh, side are you on? Yeah, I'm, I'm on the so, IT so side, but biases. I kind of bridge the gap there, right? <laughs> so uh, what we needed to do is we really needed to work with the business in order to engage them and be more proactive than reactive. So we started the emerging technologies uh, and strategy team within IT um, and our mandate was really to get out there and understand the business, understand what they're doing, work with them, um, and what we did was we, in every department, and we started with our lines department, our field departments, is we partnered with a business liaison. So we didn't want someone who was a supervisor, manager, or senior leader. We wanted someone who was, you know, a, a basically a, a senior worker um, that was well-respected by his peers, well-respected by management, and who had some influence with their peers. And we worked with them to sort of talk about you know, blue sky vision, what do you guys want to do? We also talked to senior leaders as well to find out, you know, what their aspirations were for their departments. Um, and we partnered with them to start looking at potential solutions. Um, we went out with them actually and we did field visits. We went out on the boom trucks and, and, and the bucket trucks. We went up to the top, we saw the wire, we saw what they were doing. And we started taking notes of how we can help them. So really when we started partnering with them, it was, you know, when we started looking at things like mobile tablets, uh, mobile VPNs and, and stuff like that, connectivity, it was a partnership that we did with them. Um, it wasn't something that IT was trying to push onto them. And uh, once we started doing that, when we started coming across you know, piloting and we, we needed to, them to, to evaluate certain things, to give us feedback, 
Um, we were doing that together. So we got criteria from them. We had them sit in all the vendor meetings. Uh, we had them basically choose the devices and choose the, the mechanisms that they wanted to use out in the field. So um, what we found was, I'll give you an example of where this really came into play, where this really was a good benefit. It was towards the end of the pilot phase and we were ready to go to production. I'm not going to name who our vendor was, but our vendor basically said, okay, if you hold off an extra month, um, you know, we're coming out with a new tablet that's pretty much the same as the old tablet with a few upgraded features. Everything will look, feel, and act the same, but you're going to have an enhanced GPS, unit, enhanced um, chipset. And we said, okay, no problem. It was both our decision from IT and the business decision to say, oh, let's hold off and wait. <coughs> Lessons learned here is whatever you pilot with, you should probably move to production with, um, <laughs> because when we, got, when we got the new tablet in, yeah, it looked and felt and everything was the same, but three weeks in, they all started dying. And it was a situation where, you know, whatever vendor they switched to on their back end, um, you know, there was an issue with it. So they all started dying and slowly by slowly, you know, everyone started calling us and saying, you know, we have these dead units. We called the vendor back. They couldn't figure it out. They flew in their guys from Taiwan to figure it out. Uh, eventually they did. But the lesson learned here was... Um, you know, if you're going to go with something new, even though they tell you it's the same, don't just take their word for it. Test that thoroughly, um, or just stick with the one you, you had. Um, but more importantly, the business wasn't upset. The business didn't come back and drop these tablets on IT's door and said, "What junk did you give me?" Right? And mm -hmm. we're upset and wanted to walk away. They wanted to work with us. They understood it wasn't, you know, a potential uh, an issue with something IT gave them. It was an issue with the vendor, and they were willing to work with us to correct it. Um, so overall, you know, we didn't have any. There was no negative uh, back and forth. It was very positive. We got it all fixed, and, uh, and it, was, it worked out really well. Great. I would add to that. All fantastic insights. Um, you know, lesson number one, uh, no matter how much you plan, it's going to fail. Uh, there's a quote that's something to the extent of, like, no, uh, even the best laid plan changes with contact with the enemy. Uh, it's this concept that no matter how well you plan, pilot, iteratively roll out, just expect that your devices are going to fail. Um, I don't know if any of you all have read Crossing the Chasm. If you haven't, please do yourself a favor, go read that book, come back to this conversation. Um, because essentially where we are is we are in the early adopter stage for a lot of these wearables, where the market is not, the market, the technology, the supporting markets are not yet there to make a robust enough solution. So what that means is you're getting an early entrant into the capabilities of what wearables can bring you but the trade-off is you don't have a supporting ecosystem, you don't have multiple vendors really industrially competing, and people haven't scaled to work out all the bugs. And so for those of you that are running emerging tech groups, um, the only other piece of advice that I would give um, on top of what you're saying is I love the opt-in um, strategy, which is you allow people to opt-in to the technology choice whenever possible. I've seen this work really well with a lot of technologies where you actually make the devices available. So day one, like the pilot starts, and you allow people to come to you and request, hey, let me try that tablet out. Um, and I've actually seen rollouts in a couple of companies now that went very well. Even though it takes longer and it's less coordinated, um, people feel like they're part of the beta group, like they're wanting to choose to use that tech. Uh, and if your response to me is, well, people will never use it, then you have a much bigger problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so that actually is a great lead into the next question. So what, what we've seen, um, and I've, I was talking to a handful of people around breakfast that uh, kind of echo some of the thoughts I've heard from the panel, a lot of these concepts do start with an idea generated by the person closest to the problem. Um, I, don't, I don't think any of us like being frustrated by something. And what we see is, on, on one side, you had uh, this massive um, example done in the, in the consumer space around, look at these new wearables coming out, and people would go to work and say, hmm, that might be a solution to my problem. And it produces, as Don said in the beginning, POCs springing up across the business, people wanting to solve ideas. How does a business tackle that grassroots energy and turn it into something that they can move into a corporately understood and distributed process. Well, I, I want to go back to what James was saying in that uh, IT and the business needing to come together. Um, IT typically has run the POCs. They're doing the proof of concept and they're putting it out there to make sure that if it's enterprise worthy, that it's not just a consumer solution. 
Um, our youngest generation, and everybody who knows me knows that I'm real hung up on the generational, multi-generational workforce. Our youngest generation that's coming to the workforce actually is a consumer-based thought process. They're engaged in all of this. They don't care about the enterprise. They want to solve a problem. Um, so actually moving um, this to a, a value, uh, an ROI that's not tangible in the wearables market, really, um, and how do you measure that you know, return on your investment for the enterprise at the business level? Um, and I think there's a couple of things there that, that we've had to do is actually do the opt-in. We've done the opt-in. Um, but we first had to change our um, thought process with endpoints. So endpoints were classic, um, not cell phones, but desktops that sit on your desk. And we've had to rethink from the IT's perspective, what does an endpoint actually look like? What does that mean? And how are we supporting that? And one of the examples that I'll go back to use is similar to what James is and in the opt-in process is that we have tablets or that we have cell phones or that we have um, you know, watches or those sorts of things. And we allow people then to opt-in. And it does take a lot longer. But it is a way that we can actually find out who those people are out in the business that are the grassroots. Who are the people that are interested in what? When you have 65,000 people like we do, it's really hard to keep your finger on that what are they doing around the world and who wants what to solve what problem? So, I would imagine you see this that across that thousands of, of customers that are Intel's already that are feeding this similar information back to you, correct? Yeah. I guess my perspective on the opt in is it makes total sense from a, a worker buy in. The challenge, I think, would be how do you calculate KPIs and where's the tipping point if 15% of your workforce opts in and the other 85% rejects it? Now, I like Jim's point about worker involvement in the process. So going through, hey, these are the six things we're thinking about doing. Let's work through this. Which, you know, which are you guys looking to do? And, and certainly a viral nature, especially with a millennial workforce, is you let, you let the viral nature of it take off and you let people talk about the solution and, and, and internal selling on the solution. But I think the big factor that I've seen in the enterprise side and the industrial side is that the balance of science fiction versus science fact. The premise of the next platform or five years from now, this is gonna be amazing versus how am I solving business problems today? Am I really making my workforce more efficient today? Am I solving key performance indicators in my business? I love the term frictionless. I think that's absolutely something that is gonna streamline this whole segment and our whole way of thinking about workers is this isn't an impediment to your work, this is actually improving your safety, improving your ability to do it properly. Um, but, you know, calculating that and putting the infrastructure in place to support it requires a, some sort of majority adoption within a, at least a reasonable part of time. Or I think the forward-looking investments into these new technologies are going to be seriously challenged. I don't know if you guys see it differently. I'm, I'm sure this is exactly what you're wrestling with every day. So. Don, yeah, you're shaking your head like, yeah, you were yeah. in my last meeting. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I think the other thing that, that goes to is the keynote. Um, you know, shooting for the center of the target isn't something that we did successfully, which is where your ROI goes, right? It goes to the, the highest level leadership to actually support what it is you want to do. And what we're, what we're finding is that once you have that, yes, less organized, yes, much longer opt-in process, that those people then we can capture what is making them more efficient? Is it because they had it at home? I mean, we go way back to Microsoft Office, right, when, when they had it at home. Then they come to work and go, why don't I have it? Um, and I think we're finding that same thing is true, but to identify the actual efficiencies that they're getting, we're doing sort of proof of concept is happening uh, organically. And from that, we're able to then say, what are those metrics? and capturing those metrics from the folks that are actually using the tools or using whatever wearables they are, um, or any of the new technologies for that matter. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I like that target because we have a tendency right now with so much innovation going on in this space to focus on the technology and do a what could I do with that. And my first question whenever I talk to an enterprise organization is what problem are you solving? Not let me tell you about my next cool product, or let me give you a demonstration, but what do you want to do? 
What problem are you really tackling? Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about whether technology is the right answer to that. Because I think if we just push technology at organizations and expect them to figure out a way to use it, we'll have massive failure. So your first homework was to read Crossing the Chasm. Your second <laughs> homework is to look up uh, lead user innovation theory from MIT. Uh, there's a great YouTube video, lead user innovation theory from MIT. Um, essentially it says, to, the que to your question, it says that the people who are closest to the problems are the ones that are going to invent the solutions that are actually useful in business. So um, in the power and utility market, we are the ones that are actually going to invent rudimentary solutions to our problems. Uh, then enablers come along like Intel, the IBMs, Accenture's, consulting technology groups come along to try and facilitate that process. But I, the only thing I would you know, encourage you on is do your homework. But secondly is you cannot underappreciate your lead users. Um, your lead users, I guarantee you, have created a rudimentary solution to your problem. It's going to be crude and you're going to hate the fact that they have a warehouse management system they're running in access or <laughs> that they have like some little notebook that they're writing tick marks on. But I guarantee you that's what they want and need. And at AES and past companies I've worked at, some of the most successful rollouts I've seen is whenever you just technologically enable those lead users. You allow them to be the champions of it. You, you simply just provide a more frictionless version of what they've already invented to solve their problems. Um, so. so we've got um, a handful of people here come, come to these events to start learning for the first time, figure out you know, what, what's kind of come before me that people have seen. And Chris, I'll, I'll tee this one up to you. You're getting feedback from many enterprises, SMBs, individuals about, they've already gone through that first round of learning. They're coming back around and saying, okay, here's what we went through and we, we kind of pieced something together. What are, the, what are the requirements or what are the things that companies need to consider before they get started? And your experience obviously is head-worn now, but you had a big hand in Intel's risk-worn options as well. So you've seen wearables across a, a wide dimension. What should people think about? You know, I think first and foremost, the thing they need to think about is the impact. Well, we've beaten kind of the worker impact to death, but the secondary impact, I think, is your infrastructure. My number one problem that I face right now in near eye displays, augmented reality, is the, the whole intent of that device is to tie you to a back end knowledge base, whether it's schematics or information or parts lists or some information store that I've got. And most of the organizations that we've talked to to date have them all stored in eight and a half by 11 PDF documents. Stacks and stacks and reams and reams and hard drives full of it. I see people nodding their heads in the audience going, yeah, that's us. Take that and try to put it on a near eye display. I don't care if it's a full see-through, 100 degree field of view, immersive display. It's still tough to read an eight and a half by 11 document right here in your face. So you have to think about whether implementing that, what impact that's going to have just on your core workflows. How am I going to recreate my information stores? What tools do I have? And this is where we're seeing the system integrators focusing less on the middleware of how do I glue this device into the infrastructure and more on the back end of how do I help you re-architect your information stores? I think the biggest challenge we're going to have as we look at out in that three to five to ten year horizon in going from near eye display to a full mixed reality is that your information developers are now gonna have to move from technical documentation to coding holograms in a Unity engine. That's a whole different skill set. So I love the video, but having a schematic diagram of where my pipes and valves are and being able to superimpose holograms geographically and accurately in real time with localized access and, and measuring where I am in relation to the world, that's a quantum leap in information management. That's not, a, that's not a problem that we need to solve in optics, it's a problem we need to solve in our infrastructure. That's, I think, our biggest hurdle. So just a quick time check, I think we have 10 minutes left. Um, I'll save one question at the end in case we, we don't have any takers, but you have a collection of uh, some of the industry giants up on stage right now that have gone through this before. If you guys have questions, um, we have microphone runners that will see your hand raised and, and bring the mic to you. Your 
Hi, I'm Penny Wilson from Abbey Pharmaceuticals. Uh, have any of you seen uh, a trend or an eva uh, evolution of security in the IoT device world? Uh, for those of us in regulated industries, and, and perhaps uh, you can relate to this, uh, something that holds us back is, you know, thinking about oh, the minute you have this data in these new environments, these young environments, are you exposing um, your employees or your end customers to biohacking, to, you know, other sorts of risks that weren't there before you had that data collected and that data transmitted and out there? I can take this one if, if you didn't. Go, go for it. Um, my, my prior life was computer security um, and tying into one of the things um, Chris noted, the companies that are furthest ahead in the adoption of this type of technology have already gone through the process of digitizing a lot of their information and they are distributing it over tablets, phones, mobile devices. Um, so a lot of the information that people are using, not all of it, I mean biohacking is certainly a different, different side of it, but the corporate data, a lot of the constructs, whether it's uh, security at rest, security in motion, have been adopted by the implementation side of a wearable workforce. Um, there's a significant amount to go when you tie in the multitude of new devices that are coming online from an IoT standpoint, but the human interface side of it is borrowing tried and true practices and security. And then I'll just add to that, I'll give you a trick for how to get full adoption. Is you take a wearable like a Fitbit that's tracking heart rate and you decide that we should give them to all of our people so if someone's heart rate is too high we can dispatch help. And instead of just trying to roll it out internally and deal with information standards, you just go to OSHA, which is the standard body. You explain to them why it is that this makes people safer, and then you have them require all operations to use it. Um, it sounds crazy, and it'll take you multiple years, but it is a surefire way to get your wearable to be integrated with the mass market, is to go and actually talk to the people who make the safety or the cybersecurity standards for your industry. So, uh, I'm Jeff Lynn from uh, eBusiness at Caterpillar, and I just wanted to build on what Chris said. In the, in the short run, when we talk about Unity programmers, their market may be so strong, they may end, be, end up making more than your supervisors quickly, right, <laughs> because of supply and demand. And that whole point about the back-end infrastructure, the graphics pipeline to get the content, even your engineers will need to be doing their uh, CAD modeling differently with better metadata and all to facilitate the frictionless flow of information out to support the experiences we're all looking for. And I agree that is like the number one problem is content. Got a more question over there. <laughs> Run. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, we'll use Zebra's routing algorithms Thank to you. move the microphone yes. through the crowd. Where's the, isn't there going to be a drone in here running a mic? Thank you. Um, Federico Macias, US Foods. Uh, the, the question, it seems that uh, the industry, this industry, and rightfully so, is focusing on static uh, users and use cases. In my industry, we uh, go through our warehouse uh, driving, and it seems to be a lot of uses that could, we could have here while people seeing where they have to go, etc. Uh, but any considerations about, you mentioned OSHA, about the safety issues with that, because might be even as uh, text and driving, uh, you're, you're being distracted what is in your environment. So I just want to understand what's the current thoughts about uh, the, those uh, potential issues and, and future? Uh, I, I think it's, you know, we touched on a little bit of the human factors. I, I think augmentation versus distraction is a, is a real factor. I, I think, um, like for our device, the, the current device that we're selling, the, the Recon Jet, there's a gaze detection. So the screen only lights up when you actually look down into the screen. So we don't trigger people and we're not shining a bright light in it, so we don't have the pupil dilation problem that Tom was talking about uh, because you're not constantly lighting one eyeball and, and 
you know, flickering it, trying to distract people. We do it so that it's a, it's a just in time and a need to know information. So when you look down, um, I think there's a lot of things you can do in combination with other wearables, with haptics and with other things to let someone know that they need to pay attention, but not throw it up in front of their face without knowing the context of what they're working on. I gotta imagine, Zach, you're probably dealing with this when you know, your comment about electricity kills. The last thing you wanna do is throw something up in front of a worker right. when they're at a critical moment in, in yeah. their job. I saw the video, and on the video there was an overlay where you couldn't actually see the breaker you were flipping. And I was like, oh no, don't do that. <laughs> Please, let them still see the electrical equipment that they're touching. So yeah. yeah, there's definitely a balance, it's definitely a concern, and that's why, at least companies like ours, we do a tremendous amount of offline, online testing before we roll out any new technology. I also want to come back to uh, the statement made over here about the data that we're actually creating. Because I think some of the safety is what are we delivering to the people that are in the field? So in your case, the safety is what is it that we're looking at? Are we asking their brain to comprehend a two-dimensional PDF or a, or a plan? Or are we actually putting them, geolocating them in a space? Um, and I think the move is to geolocate, but that means that we have a lot of work processes on the back end that we have to either consume that, that rudimentary data and turn it into something that is actually much more intelligent. This community, by the way, um, whether you're on the stage or in the crowd, is working on a lot of the, the different soft sciences or hard sciences that build up all these different components of an eventual, uh, I think, ubiquitous compute paradigm. But all of those things had not been figured out 10 years ago. It's, it's in the works now. I so saw two uh, hands up here. Sure. Uh, Paul Ipovancic, Canon. Um, there's a lot of talk about different pieces of uh, software, hardware, and almost every company out here that has a certain size probably can share some experiences trying something and maybe being happy, being unhappy. What is your take on what is more important with this Ford Industrial Revolution that uh, was talked about this morning. Is it the software that's the key? Is it the hardware? How are you looking when you're trying to implement something in your companies? Uh, what do you consider to be today the more important factor? Um, so, um, <clears throat> For us, I mean, the end user experience is the most important factor. Uh, it, and with regards to, I mean, obviously safety and everything else, but the the user, you know, it's a combination of hardware and software. If that user, if you give them fantastic hardware, but the software is no good or it doesn't really do what they need to do, you know, it's not going to work for them, and vice versa. So, um, the user is king when it comes to this sort of stuff. I think you need to really take a look at how they need to use it, what they need to use, um, how it's going to work for them, how it's going to work for them in, you know, in relation to what they're actually doing and make sure that that user experience is front and foremost the most important thing to them. Um, I think, you know, so to answer your question, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I think that you just need to really, it, you really need to focus on if they get this device, if is it going to give them everything they need, when they need it, how they need it, and the way they want to consume it. Um, I think that's the most important thing. So I have a, another piece of homework for you all to do that <laughs> sort of piles on James's give them what they want, when they want. Um, there's a really good study out there, it's, and it's titled Rocking the Ages. Um, most of us don't have the ability to implement within two or three months. Again, it's larger enterprise level, takes a little bit longer. And if you look at uh, Generation Z that's coming, they're looking at the interface. And they're not so worried about privacy. So the group that's coming up now that will be in our workforce in the next five years or so, will be looking at how do I interact with this. Um, it's For them, it's in the big abyss, the big cloud, the whatever you want to call it. But they really don't care about hardware and software. Yeah, and sorry, just to, to go on with that. The, this, it's exactly what you said. They're not, they're not looking at security. They don't really care about security, right? Um, for, the mo for the most part, the user, they, they think that's someone else's job. Someone else is looking at security. Um, so I can't stress enough to, to bridge that gap and to get IT and the business working together early and often. Um, too many times we've seen the business come over, knock on IT's door and said, you know, we bought this, here's the vendor, can you connect it? And we're like, uh, what are you talking about, right? Where did this come from? So 
you know, give, you have to give both sides the time to investigate, to, you know, look at the backend infrastructure, make sure things are going to work, make sure everything's secure, give your security team time to analyze everything they need to analyze, identify those risks, make sure those risks are accepted by some level of business. Um, you know, and, and that's where I can't stress enough that gap needs to be bridged. Roland Joseph with uh, Procter & Gamble. I wanted to hear your insights on how you deal with uh, the fact that one of our problems is our infrastructure, wireless land infrastructure that we have at our sites. We're built for, you know, personal devices, laptops, and those kinds of things. But now we're introducing wearables, um, which really aren't personal in a, in a manufacturing environment. They're, they're shared devices. Uh, but our wireless LAN routers are, are still using WPA2 Enterprise. So how do you authenticate? That's a huge friction point for, uh, for users. Is every time you know, I switch to a different access point or the, the device powers down, I got to re-authenticate. How do I tell everyone what the common password is? And so did you have those obstacles? How do you overcome them? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you want to? Yeah. We, uh, um, so we are a solution provider in the space, and that's something that we've gone through the evolutions of, of kind of best practices on. Um, can can answer those questions kind of in detail based on how you're set up. But the um, there is a dance being done between the OS vendors, the solution providers, and the hardware providers to make sure that those are those friction points are being cleared out. It is. I'm not going to lie to you. It is a knife fight right now across the industry to make sure all these things come together but the I think the industry the supplier side of the industry heard that loud and clear um, but the I will say that I, one of the things talking to the hardware and the OS vendors they didn't expect this to take off in enterprise like some people like were definitely carrying pitchforks this should go enterprise <laughs> but it went consumer first it had a totally different paradigm and the original the original people that put billions of dollars into this industry didn't put MDM into it, didn't put low-level security, didn't put you know, wireless uh, um, certificate management into the root um, solutions. That's coming back around now, but if, you first, if the last time you dealt with a device was Google Glass Explorer Edition, things are changing. Yeah, and I think you know, there's the, the hygiene elements of the devices is kind of the base human level, but I think we have cases where, it, whether it's shared tablets, department work group tablets, um, retail where they're used to turning over workers. A lot of it's going to be handled in the software. A lot of it's going to be done on a user login versus a device login. So yeah, laptops have all become our personal you know, safety blankets and we've got our password and our backgrounds and uh, all of our you know, files set up exactly the way we want it. These devices are going to be more of an endpoint for the cloud. So you're not really loading a lot of personal data, if any, onto these devices. They're really a conduit. It's, it's the ultimate endpoint on your face is essentially what we're looking at. So whether you're doing that through mobile gateways or you're doing that through you know, shared LAN services, your login's really going to be through the application and through the network um, and not really on the device itself. But to Brian's point, I think that just means that now our mobile device management has to extend all the way out to these devices and we need to geofence them, we need to know who's using them, we need to know what area. Um, I, again, you know, this is why I think it's so important to focus on implementing these solutions in bite-sized chunks. In, uh, you know, to the crossing the chasm analogy, if you all haven't read the book, you got the homework. Um, <laughs> but I'll foreshadow it that um, coming up from the bottom, incremental challenges to that infrastructure are how we're gonna win as an industry and how you're gonna to start to realize these tangible benefits. You're not gonna do it through a forklift upgrade of your entire infrastructure over 18 months. You're gonna do it through trial and error and putting devices in and learning how your security access needs to change, how your information management needs to change, how worker behavior and attitudes are gonna change, how the unions are gonna to react to whether it's an OSHA required device or just a good idea that management came up with. And all of those little challenges are things we're gonna to have to face that so that we can incrementally get to that grand vision of the automaton, you know, mannequin workforce. Yes, so, perfect. Um, Ocean Van with DPR Constructions. Um, so in construction industries, um, thing is not repetitive. It's like the manufacturing industry, right? Um, different projects are different from each other. So you know, a lot here, a lot wearable devices are 
geared towards the uh, the manufacturing. So how do you, how do you think about applying wearables into construction, which is have different challenge, different by different projects, uh, and how you know the data behind that have to change, or how should we attack that? I think construction's been on the forefront of the ruggedization of compute way longer than anyone else. I mean, if you look at things like the Toughbook um, and, and devices like that, they've proven that this, these things have to be ruggedized. They have to be able to hold up to pretty harsh environments. Um, it's one thing to be in a warehouse, not that that's a safe, easy place to be, but you're indoors, you're not in, exposed to environmental conditions, you don't have those types of things. So at the device level, ruggedization, absolutely first and foremost as we look at construction. Um, secondarily, I don't think you have the benefit of a managed infrastructure like you do in uh, some of these environments. So you're going to be very much required to really lean on your mobile network. What am I doing through either tablets or mobile phones and how is this an extension of that? Um, and then I think probably the third is safety and really making sure that you're not forcing the use of these devices in conditions that could compromise the workers. So just off the cuff, I haven't done a whole ton in construction, but that would be, I think, the big three that I would focus on right now. And I would, I would just ha need to add that for us, we have about 20,000 people working on construction at any point in time in 17 countries. Um, and for us, our biggest focus is safety. And so when we think of wearables, like I, I think you're right, it's going to be difficult to have an augmented space with construction because the variability of it is not fixed. Then you'll have a bill of materials, work orders, stuff like that. Um, I think for us, one of the areas that we focused on with wearables and construction is keeping our people safe. Um, so little things like making sure people are in the on site or not on site, like being aware of who's there. Old school tech, RFID badges, fantastic. Um, then upgrade it a little bit with you know wearable uh, activity monitors. Um, heart rate sensors, are people stressed in your workforce? Fall detection sensors, did somebody have a fall from height and you need to send them work? Uh, most people in an industrial setting have had more than one fatality because someone fell from height and was alone. Um, it's crazy to think about. We have people falling off roofs, beams all the time. So fall detection sensors, activity monitors, just being aware of who's on site, make sure that they have the appropriate paperwork, um, I know it's not maybe the efficiency thing that you're looking for, but it's extremely important to keep your people safe. Um, and I think that you'll find that your entire um, workload, your entire output gets improved when you put your people first. I, I want to say a little bit on that as well, because I think safety is number one in construction. But taking the next level beyond that, I think there's a lot of things, and I think there's some examples of products out there, um, you know, barcoding barcoding and have a wearable that recognizes barcodes for delivery on site is an efficiency. Um, if you think about all of the things that are delivered to or taken from a site on a daily basis, one of the things we've done in the past is every piece that comes onto site, whether it's a piece of steel, is barcoded. So we know where it is, when it is. And we can start in the construction business doing similar as what they do in the warehouses with moving packages and boxes around. So we can take some of the examples of what has actually gone before in the construction industry and start to apply that to where it would actually make us more efficient. Well, with that, thank you everyone for taking the time to share your insights to the audience. Thank you.